reminding us, particularly as healthcare providers, that race is a social construct and it was constructed historically in our past. And so race is a socially constructed way of judging, classifying, and creating difference among people. Race is not biological, and it is not genetic. It is a classification used to create hierarchies between people based on phenotype based on what you look like, so your hair and your skin, that type of thing. And then we are making a lot of assumptions about disparities or, or different groups' um, inequities and assuming that it's biological in, uh, in changes in physical health. And so there's starting to be a growing body of evidence around this. It's still early days as far as the science, but it's still worthy of note here. And so uh, this is a diagram from a meta-analytic review by researchers at Duke University who analyzed 134 papers on the health effects of discrimination. Uh, so not just racism, but discrimination in general and proposed this pathway. Um, and so they concluded, based on all of those studies, that perceived discrimination causes poor health outcomes through two pathways. So one is where discrimination acts as a chronic stressor, so that's the one going to the top, which leads to a heightened stress response. This is an increase in cortisol levels. This is just constantly being in a fight or flight state. And so you can have an increase in chronic conditions like hypertension. And then the other pathway is through developing poor coping mechanisms to deal with the chronic stress of racism. So people might smoke or drink or overeat uh, just to cope. Or even if they don't engage in those behaviors, just living with um, systemic racism and everyday microaggressions is very exhausting. And so they might be too exhausted to engage in health, like healthy behaviors, like exercise. And so um, also, this wasn't part of the study, but in my opinion, um, it also can cause um, people to delay care because of their, um, their past experiences of racism or feeling culturally unsafe in healthcare settings. <coughs> So this is another nice diagram if you're more visual, but it's essentially saying uh, the same thing. So um, at the top you see environmental stressors, so those are the everyday things. Sometimes people have major life events or trauma or abuse, but it ends up being perceived as stress in the mind, and then one can have a physiologic response. And so that, over time, is known as the allostatic load, right? The physiologic response, and it can be measured. So allostatic load is the term that describes the wear and tear on the body that it accumulates as a person is exposed to repeated chronic stressor. Um, and so there are indicators for this that can be measured in the blood, actually. So um, for instance, blood levels of cortisol, C-reactive protein, hemoglobin A1C, and other uh, physical measurements like blood pressure. So just to give um, a, a concrete example, um, so this graph is um, from uh, an American study, um, and basically, um, the, the point of this slide is really to show that black and many racialized women carry the burden of stress caused by both gender and racial discrimination. And so in the study where they measured biological indicators for chronic stress or allostatic load, uh, when you compare, so they compared black women and men, so those are the two top ones there, um, and white women and men, uh, it seems that black women um, demonstrated that they bore the greatest burden um, as shown in the graph. So they're, they're at the top and second to that is black men. And so there appears to be a greater stress burden of racialized women who are experiencing both systemic sexism and racism. Uh, so in the, the, um, in the paper they called it double jeopardy. And so um, the bottom line here is systemic racism works as a chronic stressor and racialized women appear to have the greatest physiologic response to that stress. So um, briefly, how does it also work as uh, in the indirect category? And as I mentioned, the indirect category is really the person who might not perceive stress from racism. Perhaps they grew up in another country, perhaps they're not noticing it. It's actually not stressing them out or they have really good coping mechanisms, they're meditating, they're eating well, they go for a jog, um, but nonetheless, um, income and the labor market are racialized in this country, so that whether or not it's perceived as a stress, unfortunately, um, you are more likely to be in a lower income situation if you are racialized. And so there's this experience of unearned disadvantage that people have, um, and as we know, that's simply by itself a social determinant of health. <coughs> 
Again, to give another example from Canadian data, so according to a study by the Wellesley Institute using 2006 data, um, and there's a lot on here, but I've kind of zoomed in on the main thing, they compared immigrants to immigrants in this study, and they looked at second generation and third generation. So they looked at non-racialized or uh, white um, immigrants and racialized immigrants so that they could kind of control for that assumption that it's all about acculturation and getting used to the country. That's why people's incomes are lower. And so what you can see here, what I've highlighted for you here, is that a racialized woman on average um, makes less than half of, sorry, not just a racialized, a racialized immigrant woman makes half of what a racialized, uh, sorry, a non-racialized immigrant man would make, so a white immigrant. So that's a pretty significant gap, and it persists into second generation for those who were born here. And so you've got to kind of imagine, think about your clients, right, somebody who's racialized. That means either she's going to work twice as hard, that's a mantra that's very common in, um, in racialized and immigrant groups, you work twice as hard. But what happens when she's pregnant and working twice as hard? Let's say she decides not to work twice as hard, she's at peace with where she is, so you know, there's a saying, you cut your, your cloth according to your size. Well, that means that she might be living in a condition where she cannot afford the right nutrition or live in a healthy environment for, uh, for herself and her unborn child. And so that is going to have an impact on health. Again, regardless of whether or not the person recognizes it as a stressor due to, due to race. So again, that's why I separate them because the indirect is the being more likely to live in poverty, which we know is a social determinant of health, but the direct one where it's a chronic stressor, well, we see that even when you control for socioeconomic status. So even a rich racialized person can have um, the health effects of racism. Okay, so now to go into maternal health. You guys are the experts here on maternal health, so I'm briefly touching upon this because I wanted to kind of address, you know, what you might be seeing uh, in your everyday work. And so there are also studies demonstrating that the increased stress and poor living conditions experienced by racialized groups um, seem to manifest themselves um, during a most vulnerable time in a person's life, right? So uh, that would be during pregnancy, potentially affecting the next generation. So in the United States, numerous studies have demonstrated that African American women have poorer birth outcomes than the white population, even when you control for socioeconomic status. In Canada, Indigenous babies have twice the mortality of non-Indigenous babies. Black Canadian women have a higher incidence of lower birth weight babies and preterm births. Both, as you know, are associated with poorer outcomes. Now, what's interesting is this doesn't just apply to women from historically disadvantaged groups.